Oh, hi there, folks. Uh, so I just did a video on the SP version of this kit, uh, but now I've got the GBA version of this kit. Uh, so this is a newer kit from uh, one chip, as it were. Um, the Game Boy Advance version, or the Game Boy Advance SP version, was... Uh, pretty self-contained. It was just like the display assembly with the backlight kit and it was all kind of one unit. So when you ordered it, you got the unit, the drop-in unit, and then a single wire for wiring up the button controls. Uh, but this one is a little bit more complicated in terms of uh, what accessories it comes with. Um, so you've got the LCD itself and the conversion board and set that aside. Uh, we've got some adhesive to hold the LCD into the screen. Uh, we've got two different ribbon cables here, uh, 30 pin and a, or a 32 pin and a 40 pin, depending on which variant GBA you have. Two laser cut pieces of acrylic to use as spacers to get this centered within the housing. Uh, this little bit of what I'm fairly certain is more adhesive. Don't know what that's for yet. Um, We've got three wires for the button controls. Uh, this thing does include an OSD. We'll see how that works once we've got it wired up. Um, also got a lens. This is probably OEM sized because this is a little bit smaller of an LCD compared to the older backlight kits that use the 9380 LCD. This is a 3.0 inch diagonal, whereas the uh, stock Game Boy Advance is about 2.9 ish. 3.0 inches it's it, it, it's depending on how you measure it. if you're measuring the LCD itself versus the lens and so on and so forth because it's offset it's complicated I don't want to get into it uh, the 9380 ones were 3.2 inches diagonally however they were noticeably bigger um, so yeah probably an OEM lens and then two little strips of um, just uh, adhesive film for insulation. So you get quite a bit more, but if you've seen any of my videos on, on kits like this before, this is all probably very familiar. Um, and if you've done one of these yourself, then, well, it's gonna be pretty much the same. I'm gonna go ahead and set all of this aside for now. Our donor tonight is going to be this wonderful limited edition GBA uh, that is quite beat up and that I have modded previously. Um, I believe I have an older version of a cloud game store kit in this thing. So we have a touch sensor and if I press and hold the touch sensor, ooh, it's not the older version. Just kidding. That is the one with the pixel grid. Uh, so I guess we're gonna not mod this GBA today. Uh, Cause that's not the kid I thought it was. Instead, let's do this GBA. Which has, I, I grabbed three GBAs for this video cause I wasn't sure which one I was gonna end up using. Uh, this one I believe has an older version of either the Cloud Game Store kit or the drop-in kit from the older version of this kit uh, because we have the touch sensor here but if we press and hold there are no extra features uh, so no pixel grid emulation or anything like that it's just brightness controls and if I recall correctly this one doesn't even store settings yep so yeah the backlight kit is perfectly fine the Game Boy is totally usable but at this point I only have so many Game Boys and um, well, there's no point in keeping the old kits hanging around, you know? At some point, I no longer have the need to test them because they fall by the wayside, discontinued, out of support, etc. power supply right here to test power usage. I went and fetched an OEM screen for that other Game Boy that 
uh, Eon edition was a 32 pin and I had to go find one of these apparently I don't have them laying around uh, but this is a 40 pin and I do have those laying around so we can still get some power usage numbers V3. Okay, so this is an older Cloud Game Store kit. Not exactly the best comparison. I guess this specific install predates me remembering to label all my Game Boys with the kits that are inside of them. So this one was drop-in, there were zero modifications done to this board, so as soon as I hook up the stock LCD, it will be like I had never even modified it in the first place. Uh, getting this out, on the other hand, might... Oh, I see what it was stuck on. The touch sensors adhered to the shell. I forgot I did that. So if we... Pull that off, maybe. There we go. Let me get that whole thing out of there. Ta da! I'll save this for something. Did I use. Oh, I didn't use adhesive. Or I did, but it's not very secure. That might be pretty reasonable to get out of here. I don't know what the heck I was doing when I built this. But at least one of the things I was doing was making my life easier for the future. That's convenient. Yeah, that's probably fine. <laughs> okay. I have no idea what's going on with that, but sure. Okay, and then I shall set this aside and we shall save it. Something else, I guess. Oh, that's going to be a pain in the butt. I should have peeled the adhesive off that. Whatever, I can deal with that later. right it came with that single strip of adhesive that foam well there you go there's a look at Game Boy modding that we don't usually get to see undoing the Game Boy mods Good to go to continue testing. Test. 
So this thing could probably use a power switch clean, but eh, we'll get to that later. Come on. I hate the quick settings menu because you have to hit both of these buttons at the exact same time. There we go. I'll set that to my quick set, 2.4 volts. Connect up the power supply, turn it on, and then the Game Boy just, well, it didn't boot that time, but it does work. <laughs> there it goes. Alright, so in the overworld, in the exact same place I always test with the exact same game, same voltage, blah blah blah. 2.4 volts before modding this thing, it is pulling 115 to 120 milliamps, which... Uh, 123 on the high side, excuse me. Uh, which, a little high. Um, not that atypical for a Game Boy Advance, especially an older 40-pin model. Um, this screen is a little bit less power efficient than some of the later models, in my experience. Uh, it's kind of hard to test that. Whoops. Game Boy crashed. Um, kind of hard to test that because we can't hook up a 32-pin screen to this console without a redundant power supply. Um, but eh, it's pretty typical in my experience with these models. Anyway. We can improve upon that by just cleaning up the power switch. I think that would make a significant difference in the power usage. Anyway, let's test out the new kit so we know it works before we go through the effort of installing it. And I've got a 40-pin GBA, which means I need the 40-pin cable. Plug that in on the on the mod PCB board side, PCB side. Uh, both the ribbon cables go pins down. On the GBA side, the ribbon cable goes pins up. And then it just goes like that. But I'm going to leave it flat so that uh, I don't have to worry about insulating it against anything. And then it should just boot right up. Ta-da! Okay. And in the overworld, same place I always test, yada yada. Uh, after the mod, 2.4 volts, it is pulling... Oh, that was sharp. Um... 315 to 323 milliamps, uh, which is quite significant. Yes, hello. Okay. Um, not great, but it's kind of what I expected, especially since I just did the SP version of this kit and power usage was pretty rough on that too. It's sharp because there's a bit of glass in there. 
I think that went into my finger. Anyway, uh, we've got two touch, touch sensors. I believe this top one is for color palettes, maybe. Yep, you gotta press and hold. It's kind of weird. Uh, bottom one should be for brightness. Well, top in this orientation. Uh, just tapping should be good. Uh, I believe there are the same 15 levels of brightness. So at the lowest brightness, it is pulling 242 to 247 milliamps. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 levels of brightness. And on the high end of the brightness spectrum, it is pulling 436 to 441 milliamps. Um, that's a lot. <laughs> and then it just resets back to the beginning. Um, and maybe a press and hold on this does the pixel grid stuff. Let me turn up the brightness first. I can sit here all day talking to myself, but the second I start filming, someone wants to have a conversation with me. Yeah, pressing and holding the uh, touch sensor for brightness swaps us through the pixel grid modes. Um, I'll show that a little bit more when we have it assembled and it's easier to manipulate. Uh, so let's go ahead and shut this down. We will continue with the install here. Unplug the power supply, plug in my camera. Let's carry on with the install. Disconnect that. And that. So as you can see, we don't need to do any soldering to get this thing installed, but if we want to make use of all of the features, it will be easier to do some soldering. So I'll go ahead and boot up my soldering iron here. We'll get these wires connected and then we'll go from there. Yes. All right, so we're going to solder TP2 down here for select. I'm gonna go ahead and get that tinned. We're going to solder TP9 up here for the left shoulder button, get that tinned. And then over here, we want TP8 for the right shoulder button. Come on. There we go. You know what? Let's use tweezers. It'll make my life easier, won't it? Soldered up, and one more. Excellent. Quick inspection here. Is that not on? That's not on. My bad. Not the 
the cleanest joints, but certainly nothing wrong with them. I think we'll be good. I am going to do a little bit of cable management to try and make this a little bit neater. Uh, and that is going to involve feeding the select wire underneath the CPU legs just to try and uh, wrangle this thing a little bit. Uh, gonna be doing the same thing for this bad boy though it would be a little bit easier to route it up and around so that's what I'm gonna do and then through the top just like that You know what? We'll just run it right between those two LEDs. Why not? What could possibly go wrong with that? That's almost definitely going to hit a support in the shell, but check that out in a minute. Uh, unfortunately, with the left shoulder button, I don't really have any options as far as managing this thing, but when we shorten it up, it should be a little bit better. Uh, I'm gonna plug this in. That way I can get an idea of how long these cables need to be. And I can uh, route them as such. So this one's a little on the long side. Kind of expected that. And we're going to be soldering right here to select R and L. Mm. Be careful because I guess they decided to use a sticker instead of just putting the label on the um, PCB. And I don't remember which is which. So I might get L and R backwards. I'm fairly certain this one is L. So I totally just messed up that label with my soldering iron. make this R. It's a little on the short side, but it'll uh, it'll straighten out when we got this thing bent. And this last one is going to be select, which is also a little bit long. Only a little bit. The ground connection through the ribbon cable should be sufficient for the button controls. So we should be good to go. Next up is preparing our shell. Uh, the instructions say that we should trim out this support here, uh, but then the pictures don't seem to indicate that they've done so. Mm. I don't know. Let's see how it fits. 
So this is supposed to go in here like that. And it is also supposed to behind these things. One goes on the bottom, one goes on the side. Yeah, I think we should trim it because the LCD sits on top of that and if we send this as is, it will work, but the LCD will be sitting in the housing kind of crooked. You can see looking at the top shell how it's further away from the shell on this side and it's right up against the shell on this side. So we're going to go ahead and trim that. And they do make da, 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 these like angled flush cutters that you can use. That might make something like this pretty easy, but I don't I don't see a way to get this in there and get clean cuts. Can I use my regular flush cutters? No, I'm gonna have the exact same problem. There is a way to do it, but at this point. I'm just going to go do this on my Dremel because, I mean, I have the tool. I'm going to make it easier for myself. Uh, but you can make it work with flush cutters. I just don't recommend it. Uh, but anyway, I'll be right back. Through the power of movie magic. It is nicely trimmed now. I did the bottom and the side just because I was already there and I'd have to clean up afterwards anyway. Um, but I believe we only need to do the side. if you're reshelling the Game Boy, use a generic aftermarket shell, you'll have to do the exact same thing. But if we were to use something like one of these Cloud Game Store shells, these things already don't have that ridge in there, so it should just drop right into this. It's probably easier to use one of these bad boys, uh, but I don't know. I, I, I dig the aesthetic here, so I'm going to keep using that. Okay. So now we need to figure out the placement. I kind of don't want to use this, like just in case I want to remove this again at some point, but eh, we'll commit. So we want to get this lined up. This is directional. Um, you might be looking at this thinking, oh, that center square is um, not centered. But that appears to be on purpose. Uh, and normally we would be doing this without the lens in the shell. If you do have the lens in the shell and don't want to remove it, um, remove the center square. If you do not have the lens in the shell, um, just Leave the center square installed and then just remove the adhesive on the edge. Leave the center square in there. And then you can just place that down and then pop the center square out. The reason we want to leave it is because it's going to give this a little bit more structure as you're handling it. Otherwise, it's going to get all loosey goosey and flop about, and we don't really want that. Uh, but that just goes in the top corner. Place that down. And I left the center square installed, so I'm going to have to remove it. But it shouldn't be too difficult. See, if we don't have the lens installed, you just push it through. But I do, so I can't. Hmm. This will be a lot easier if I make use of the tools I have available to me, or just find random stuff on my desk. Ta-da. Now I can save that for, I don't know, something. 
Uh, but the placement is pretty good. I don't think we'll be able to see any of that adhesive from the front. Looks pretty decent. I'm going to peel up the Install one of the brackets against the edge here, and the other bracket. I guess it doesn't really have to be installed, it doesn't hit the adhesive. Uh, but we'll leave it there for placement. And then otherwise, this goes in here like this. We line it up with the brackets. And hopefully that's good because taking that out is going to be somewhat destructive. Now we'll go ahead and install our insulating film. I don't think we need it, but the manufacturer says to install it, so let's install it, just in case. Oh, nuts. At some point, I knocked this thing about and broke the bale. Um, that's awkward. Let me see if I can fix that. Slip it back in. I'll be right back. Okay. Wasn't too bad to slip back in. I just had to carefully open it and then I could press it down into the connector and it's all good. Um, I must have accidentally just knocked it with a tool or something um, because it was working when I tested it. But I did something silly. And messed it up. Did I unpause that? I did. Okay, good. That slipped in. Now we'll use our other. Oh, this is probably to hold that bracket in. Um, I'm not going to bother because the bracket works the exact same whether or not it's secured. And, you know, that, that ship has kind of already sailed, so... Alright, where does it say we should put the touchpads? It says one. We can put down here. This is going to be the brightness touchpad. We will drop it right in the middle, because why the heck not? it down. Just want to make sure it's secured and doesn't go anywhere when I start manipulating this thing. And then I'll bend that over here because it says the other one we should put in in a place I'm not so sure I agree with, but let's see let's see what happens if we stick with what the manufacturer says. Put that right in the middle of this cutout. And I'm not using a clear shell, so I suppose I don't have to actually get that aligned or centered. But I'm going to press it down, make sure it's nice and stuck down. And I think we're good to go to reassemble. I'm just going to tuck the wires away. Make sure they're not getting in the way of stuff. I'm 
<laughs> yeah, that wire in between the LEDs doesn't work at all, uh, because guess what? It hits the light pipe. That's okay. I'm just going to try and stretch it around. There we go. Uh, okay, that doesn't work though. We need to come back and with some flush cutters or something, I'm going to cut a small channel in this wall here for the wire to pass through so that it does not get pinched. And then while I'm assembling this, I'll just need to feed that wire into the channel I cut. Maybe. And then when we screw everything together, it'll be nice and happy and not squished, ideally. There we go. <laughs> Only took enough fiddling. What about the other side? Uh, the other side is totally good so long as we clear this screw post uh, and we're not doing that. So let's fix that too. Exact same deal, I am just going to cut a small notch. Or I guess it's a V shape. Just like that. That's not going to pinch. This one, on the other hand, it's like all the way on the other side of what we need it to be. There we go. Just had to pick up the slack. And then that goes into the notch I cut. And we should be good. No wires pinching. These already tightened. Yep. And then if the wire's in the way of the shoulder button, just kind of push it out of the way and it'll, it'll settle in between the shoulder button and the housing. Just make sure you're not actually uh, pinching it on the, the spring. cross-threaded that screw at first so I wasn't paying enough attention when when threading screws into plastic that's already threaded 
you rotate it backwards until you hear the click or feel the click and then you can go ahead and screw it in and then once you've got it bottomed out just back it up a quarter of a turn or so um, plastic or metal into plastic means that it is very easy to put entirely too much tension on these screws uh, and doing so could cause the plastic housing to break. We don't want that. We also don't want to strip out the screw posts. And this is an easy way to avoid that. I'll say this right now, if you need to crank your screws down as absolutely tight as possible to hold the housing together, you're doing something wrong. Check and see what's not fitting. Unless it's just a crummy aftermarket housing that just doesn't fit. Uh, but that's not the case for OEM. Uh, and I don't believe that's the case for any of the newer... Oopsie doodle aftermarket shells from like Funny Playing or Cloud Game Store or the like. Hey, it works! Not that I expected any different, of course. Alright. Put that away. Put that away. Put that away. And we're almost done here. So let's try out, I'm going to start with the EverDrive here, and we're going to run a couple quick tests that I already know is going to pass because I already tested this on a different Game Boy. Um, but we're going to go ahead and run the Zelda test, let me kill that light. And so what we're looking at here, sorry I'm trying to find a way that's comfortable for me to hold this in frame. Steady. Alright, uh, so I've done this spiel about a million times already, um, but original Game Boy games did not have a way to achieve transparency on the LCD, um, that the hardware just didn't support transparency. Uh, so developers instead took advantage of a quirk of the LCD itself, in that the original LCDs just had really terrible pixel response times, uh, so they could flicker something on, like a sprite, or this chain for example, uh, on and off as fast as the Game Boy would allow, which is about 60 times a second, and uh, because of the terrible pixel response time it would result in a nice, smooth, transparent sprite. Um, newer screens have much better pixel response times, so instead of the nice transparency effect, you just get flickering, which, I mean, it is what it is, um, but in some games that can be somewhat bothersome. Uh, Legend of Zelda, I don't see any problems with it in this. I know it also does the same effect during the credits, but I don't have a save that's at the credits, and even if I did, I don't want to do that boss fight on video. Um, so, verdict is, in person, I can see the flickering. But in this particular case, it's not distracting and I don't see any issues with it. It's not ideal, but um, it's certainly not the worst that I've seen. The other issue was this green grass and these brown wooden posts. Uh, the green and brown, I don't know what it is about these two specific colors, but uh, some of the older 9380 based backlight kits struggle transitioning between the, that color green and that color brown, and it results in some uh, overshoot of the pixels themselves, so you'll see artifacting across the screen as it scrolls. The artifacting does disappear quite, quite quick. Um, so like in less than a second, the artifacting will be gone, but it's there and it's noticeable and it looks bad. I don't see any of that on this kit. So the screen that they're using for this kit does handle that specific effect a little bit better. There might be some other color combos that trip this thing up, but I haven't seen any in my limited testing, and I haven't seen anyone report anything either, but eh, there's still time. 
Uh, so, so far, that's pretty good. Let's do the other test. Let's do the screen reset. Uh, so older kits would struggle with the uh, screen reset. What is it under Matt Curie? Yes. Uh, so what this does is this is going to show a constant uh, thing scrolling across the screen. And when the letter S in the word scrolling hits the left hand side of the screen, uh, the ROM is issuing an LCD reset command. Uh, so what that does is LCDs are drawn with the pixels row by row, uh, column by column in each row. So they'll fill out a whole row. They'll fill out every column in a row then move on to the next row and keep going back and forth until you've got the entire screen filled. Uh, this thing, the original GBA has a height of like 160 pixels, so it's doing 160 rows a second. Uh, an LCD reset command lets the Game Boy skip to the next frame without finishing the current frame. So let's say we've only got like a third of the way through the screen. The reset will say, okay, we're done drawing this frame, let's just move on to the next one. Um, older backlight kits would struggle with that. Sometimes they'd crash, sometimes they'd hang up for like 40 seconds. No, not 40 seconds, that seems long. Um, it was more like two or three seconds. Uh, but in games that regularly utilize this, for example, Pokemon Pinball, um, your screen not working for three to four seconds every time it shifts between the upper and lower bounds means you're gonna lose the game quite frequently. Um, I haven't seen this be an issue in kits like in the last two years, uh, well, three years at this point. Um, and I'm pleased to announce that there are no issues with this kit either, uh, at least not with this particular test. Uh, another thing that would happen, instead of just dropping frames entirely for three or four seconds, uh, they would start um, juddering or tearing, and none of that is present here either. So all is well, I think. Next, let's do 240p test suite. Okay, so just do quick grid test, make sure that there's nothing cut off. And unfortunately with my install, the right hand side is cut off. Uh, I don't know if that's a positioning thing, it's cut off. So I think we could have gone over that side a little bit more. But overall, it seems fine. I'm triggering the color palettes accidentally just by holding the Game Boy. Um, I don't, that is one of my uh, concerns about the touch sensor there is I'm going to trigger that frequently. Um, let's see if we can pull up the OSD. I believe it's select L and R. Maybe. No. Oh, yep, there it is. I don't know what was going on there. Okay, so select moves us through the options in the menu and then, oops. That was like the wrong one to test. <laughs> Try and bring that up again, maybe. There it goes, oh. Is it just holding select? No. That would be silly when you have three buttons. Hmm. I don't know how to, oh. <laughs> oh, I get it. You just gotta press and release all three at the same time. You don't have to hold. It just doesn't come up until you release. Okay, so we can go through the options with select and then change the settings with L and R. I actually like that a lot. That is very intuitive, very easy to do. Uh, it does not loop through, so once you've maxed out, you've gotta use the other button. Uh, same thing with brightness. Uh, and then we've got the four pixel grid modes. Uh, so the default is no pixel grid. Um, that is pixel effect one. Pixel effect two is both horizontal and vertical pixel grids. 
pixel effect 3 is just vertical and then pixel effect 4 is just horizontal. With this particular kit, I like no pixel grid. Um, I know with uh, other kits, specifically Funny Playing's 3.0 IPS, I do actually like the pixel grid on on this particular kit, uh, but this kit does not use integer scaling to display the image. Uh, it's a little bit uneven, and I think the pixel grid, um, I think the pixel grid hides some of the uneven scaling, and it results in a better look. And the kit itself looks totally fine, but with integer scaling, I don't care for that. I think this is better. Um, and our control, uh, full screen stripes. Pull that up, pull that up, pull that up, and you can see it is nice and even in both directions. I like it. I'm into it. I tested this on the SP one, uh, but I don't expect any different results here. I'm gonna hold that this way. So this is the same thing that we tested with Legend of Zelda. Uh, with the chain. This is just flickering the spray on and off real quick. I'm not really seeing the effect on my phone, but hopefully it comes out in the video. Um, what we see is just plenty of flickering. Uh, I expected that behavior, but the other thing that this test allows us to test, since it puts the flickering in one spot and leaves it there, uh, is if there's any image retention as a result of the flickering. The older 9380 based kits do have some pretty significant image retention for whenever there's any objects flickering on screen. And you can move that around. I can see the same thing is present with this kit, though to a slightly lesser extreme. Um, again, I'm not seeing it on the phone preview, but in the actual video, I hope it comes out. I moved the square over to his uh, right eye or left eye. Um, and I can still see a little bit of a ghost, a uh, little image retention where it was flickering right there. And then since I've left that there for a while, when I move it again, I will see some image retention there. Even when I back out and go to a different menu, I can still see some flickering elsewhere. I don't know if that is, I don't know if that's inherent to this type of LCD, if the LCD is not being driven at the proper voltage, something, I, I don't know what that is. All I know is, this is kind of what you're going to have to expect with this sort of kit. Um, all in all, it's pretty fine. Uh, the biggest effect that the um, image retention has is with games like the Famicom Classics. Uh, so Nintendo, when they made this game, they just took the original NES version and then kind of sort of ported it to GBA without... Uh, without really remaking it. And the original NES had a higher vertical pixel resolution than the GBA. So how did they work around that? Well, they just kind of squished it and that results in quite a bit of flickering artifacts on stuff like the clouds, the ground, these bushes. Um, it's not great. Other kits display a lot of artifacting. Uh, this kit, you can see the artifacting if you look for it, uh, but it's, Totally playable. It does detract somewhat from the experience, but oh my goodness. It is not the worst kit, I'll say that. Oop. Oops. Oh well. Doesn't matter. None of this matters. Works fine. You can see that artifacting though, um, and especially when it goes to a new level, you'll see... Oops. Touch sensors right there. Uh, maybe you can see in that gap, there's a little bit of flickering from the, from the floor from earlier parts in the level. It is what it is. Personally, I don't have a problem with it. 
but I can see why it might be an issue. Um, for the most part, I play like a handful of games um, and none of the games I play have any transparency in them, so there's zero effect on how I play. Uh, let's try... Those are turbo means. So that's what it looks like in the overworld there. And we can bring up the pixel effects. I can cycle through those options real quick. And you know, if you like it, you like it. If not, well, that's fine too. It's nice that you have the option. On the GBA specifically, uh, I think I think the pixel grid options actually look a little bit better than they did on the SP. I know they're doing the exact same thing. I just something about not being laminated helps to mask some of the ugliness of the effect, I think. Um, I don't know. I think I'll still play it without, especially since this kit is such heavy power usage. I mean, you can see my power LED's been red this whole time, and these batteries should be freshly charged. Um, replacing one-third of the columns or rows with black pixels does reduce the effective brightness. Uh, which means to keep it at the same level of brightness with the pixel grid on, it is using even more power. If you keep the backlight level at the exact same, so um, at brightness level 11, you can do that, that's fine, but it changes the perceived brightness because of how many pixels uh, you're using to display the image. So I don't like it, but it is what it is. Anyway, I think that's about all I've got here. Um, this went entirely too smooth. Something, something should be wrong. Maybe it's about to turn off with how dim that's getting. Let's bump it up even more. We'll see how long it takes while I finish talking. Uh, so I think that's about all I've got. Pretty decent kit. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, uh, this is going to end up replacing the 9380-based kits that they've done previously. Uh, it's also going to replace the um, drop-in style kits that they've done previously. Uh, for those of you that were a fan of the drop-in style kits, I think this is going to be an upgrade in just about every single way. Uh, except for maybe power usage. I'll have to check my spreadsheet to be sure on that one. Um, but for the 9380 based kits, yeah, there are some trade-offs. You do get more features. Um, personally, I don't care for some of the features. Like the OSD is nice, sure. It's cool to use. It makes it a lot easier to manage. But I don't, I don't know of a single use case where these color filters are something that I would want to use. Maybe the black and white, maybe for some old DMG games that you can't, or not DMG, for some Game Boy Color games that you can't override the color palette on. I don't know. Um, but the image quality itself does seem pretty comparable. The viewing angles are... They're fantastic. Um, the only single downside that I can see is that uh, this is a 3... 0.0 inch diagonally measured LCD, whereas the 9380 based kits were 3.2 inches. So I think a little bit bigger in the exact same form factor was the better call, but unfortunately those LCDs are apparently getting harder to find and the ones that can be found are a little bit more expensive. Uh, so if this has to replace it, so be it. I think it's okay. Um, but yeah, my, my biggest qualms were 
power usage. Um, oh, before we before I finish up here, let's actually do. I don't have a suction cup. I recommend keeping a suction cup handy for removing lenses. Uh, can I? Is that going to happen? No, nah, I think I need to find a suction cup. This is the original plastic lens. I wanted to see if the replacement is going to be any better. Peel the tape off here. And I'll just check the alignment. Hmm. Maybe. Looks like it might fit a little bit better. Uh, I can see that the window on the lens is a little bit more open on the right side for this one. I don't know if it's just wider in general, but it's probably a good idea to use that lens. Uh, the height seems the same on the cutout though. So yeah, swapping that out might be a good idea, but I kind of want to stick with the original gray because these are a different color. The new lens is black, whereas the old one is gray. So, I don't know. I'm not going to bother trying to pry that out because it's perfectly good and I like it. Um, but this might be the better call. Anyway, I think that's all I've got. I think I'll end this here. Um, shout out to Retro Game Repair Shop for providing this kit to me to check out. Um, I will go ahead and throw a link to their store in the description. Um, as of filming this right now, um, February 2nd, 2023, they don't have it listed. I don't know if they plan on stocking it, uh, or if they are going to stock it and they just haven't made the listing yet or whatever, cause these, these are brand new. Um, but if they stock it, if they throw a link up, I'll throw that link in the uh, description there. Um, otherwise you can, you can find these pretty easily on AliExpress. They might be even a little bit cheaper, but then you have to deal with AliExpress shipping and it's going to be like a month before you get it on a good day. Um, but it is what it is. Anyway, uh, links in the description. I will also throw a link to my site in the description, which has a link to all of the tools and such that I use, like the PCB holder. I didn't use it in this video, but I use them frequently. Um, power supply I got, that sort of stuff. Uh, but it also has a link to the wiki that I maintain, and it has quick notes on all of the backlight kits that I have messed with. Um, not yet, but it will have notes on this kit too. So if you're looking at this, you know, we're an hour into the video at this point, and you know, you're, you're looking at this, you're watching the video, you're listening to the BS that I'm spewing, and you're like, okay, but Mako, what's the best backlight kit? Check my wiki. Um, I have notes on there. Uh, I have things summed up, what I liked, what I didn't like, that sort of stuff. So you don't have to sit down and watch an hour long video on every backlight kit that you're interested in. And since for GBA, there's like 12 backlight kits on the market right now. Um, that's, that's a lot of research. Uh, so if you're, you know, if you don't have any specific needs, like you don't care about X feature or Y feature, you know, there might be a better backlight kit for you. Um, if you're the type that already has a modded Game Boy Advance and you just, you know, you're, you're looking at this backlight kit going, hey, I really like that new feature. I'm going to upgrade my Game Boy Advance. Don't. I, every time someone asks me this, I, I don't say it in video quite often enough. I think I said it in the video I did on the SP version of this kit. Um, the best backlight kit is the one you already own. Like, sure, this has some shiny new features, but it effectively does the same thing. So, you know, if you're building something new, yeah, it's a good option. But if you've already got something, there's very little benefit to um, swapping that kit out. Of course, I did that, but I, I do lots of things for YouTube that don't necessarily translate to the real world. So it is what it is. Anyway, that's all I've got. If you let me ramble, I will ramble all night. So I'm going to 
I'm going to kill it here. Um, thanks for watching. Check the description for links, and I hope you all have a fantastic day.